Okay, are we ready to go ahead and get started? All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're here to talk about your retirement. Uh, my name is Danette Carr. I am with Ohio University Credit Union um, in the CUSO Financial Services area. I am here with Kamichelle Bradley. Uh, she's a financial advisor here and will be presenting for us today. Um, we partner with Voya Financial and um, here at the OU Credit Union, we partner with Voya and by partnering with Voya, we're able to provide retirement accounts for Ohio University employees. Um, Jim Siders is also here with us in the line today and Jim is with Voya Financial. Um, Jim comes to us with uh, in-depth experience um, with the state uh, sponsored plans for OPERS and STRS and SIRS. Um, with, by saying that, I would also like to know what you guys participate in. Um, are you part of STRS, STRS? Are you part of uh, SIRS or OPERS? Um, are you in the ARP? We're kind of just curious to get a little bit of um, a gauge on who's participating with us today. Um, we kind of want to make sure that we touch on the plans that you guys participate in and we want to make sure what we get your questions answered. So if you don't mind, if you'll put a little comment in the chat that we have, um, whether you're with SDRS or OPERS or SIRS, or maybe you're in the ARP, um, we're kind of just curious just so we know. If you don't mind giving us a little comment, we'd appreciate it. And um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get moving on our slides here. Um, so this is a little bit of our legalese, just you know, the required documentation we provide to you. Um, but I'm going to actually pass it over now to Kamichelle Bradley, and she's going to begin for us. Go ahead, Kamichelle. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are going to to uh, to talk today about retirement planning. It's what we do every day here, and it's always a pleasure to kind of um, address individually um, on a one-by-one -one basis, but the opportunity to actually do a global presentation um, is wonderful. So, um, with that said, if you're wondering if you're in the right place and if you need to be listening to this, are we going to talk about people who are retiring next year? Well, the answer is no. Um, this is an, a high level retirement conversation to, that will um, hopefully help you understand what you need to retire, what you need to retire. Um, the other objective we're going to look at is, is what you will have to retire. So we'll actually talk about how you can add that up and, and set, you know, set some expectations. Um, how to maximize your retirement fund. So whether or not you're in the STRS or OPERS, you're in the regular pension system, um, or if you participate in the ARP, the question that many people have is, do I have enough? Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about how you can make your own personal plan uh, now that you kind of have a general understanding. So let's address uh, the first question, which is, what do I need to retire? And um, generally speaking, this is a change of mindset. So it's kind of hard, uh, but step out with me for just a moment and think about right now, our conversation today is how much do I need to spend? What am I going to need in retirement? But if you can kind of imagine yourself already retired, the, the mindset that you're, you're going to have at that point in time is, um, how can I, do I have enough money, right? So, so we're kind of going to back into that, to answering that question and just kind of let you know that it really depends. Um, and it's, it's on an individual basis of what you really need to retire. A lot of people, you know, rule of thumb is 60 to 90% of your current income is what you need. But that really all depends. It depends on what your retirement looks like. If you're thinking about uh, traveling, after you retire and you know sitting on the beach and and maybe ordering multiple mai tais or just catching a few more shows um, then you could be spending more money than what you that you do now um, on the other hand if your idea is spending quality time with a family and uh, kind of staying close to home then you could probably save at the level of about 60 uh, percent of what you make right now. What we want to avoid at all costs is you getting to the point of retirement and going, oh my goodness, why didn't I think about this until now? So um, today we'll we'll just kind of kind of talk about what it is that you're going to need. The risks that you we have to consider when we're saving, right? So now that we let's say, okay, I'm I'm going to spend. 75% of my income in retirement and you do the math and you figure out, okay, this is how much I need. 
um, how do you get there? And what are the risks of preventing me from having that amount of money um, after we've done the math? And um, the number one risk really is healthcare. And we talk about it just about every day with people, especially those who want to retire prior to age 65. Um, the cost of health care has grown faster than the prices of really just the general economy. So, you know, it's kind of outpaced inflation. As a matter of fact, it's in the last decade alone, health care costs have increased by about 20 percent, um, according to uh, our sources, um, our health system trackers that, that we watch. Um, experts estimate that 15 percent of the average retirees' expenses will be for healthcare. So it's a really big part of your planning because we're planning on our expenses. Um, what other kind of risks are we gonna have? Well, um, <laughs> growing older really is a risk, right? So we wanna make sure that you're not going to outlive your money. So however big your pot is, I mean, it's not to, to get uh, you know morbid and say, oh my gosh, I only have enough to live until I'm 80. You know, our plan really is to, or your plan should include living uh, 30 to 35 years uh, in retirement. You know, one statistic that I that I do like to share, and I don't want to scare anybody out there, but um, the Census Bureau came out in 2010 and said, you know what, if you are um, 65 and you're married, your chances of living, one of you at least, into your 90s is about 40%. So, you know, just by, you know, being around people, people who love you, um, can actually increase the length of your life. So, you know, that's a good thing. We don't want to be all by ourselves in retirement. Um, so we need to plan for that. So if you're asking, okay, I know I've got to save, how much money do I need? Well, if you're planning to retire at 65 and we're going to live until 95, mathematically, we need to plan for 30 years of expenses, okay? So uh, other retirement risks that we, that we talked about. We talked about living too long. We talked about the cost of health care going up. Can anybody uh, think of some other risks that you could have in retirement to your your amount of savings. And Danette, I'm gonna rely on you to uh, read some of them out if you get any. I'll throw in one, um, changes in inflation. That's a big one, right? It's part of anybody's plan as you calculate what you think inflation is going to be. Um, a common uh, inflation uh, amount that we usually include is anywhere between 2.5 as a minimum uh, all the way up to 5%. Really depends uh, on your perspective um, of the overall economy and kind of where we're heading. Uh, stock market returns is another risk. Mm -hmm. oh, yep. Okay. On there. <laughs> Someone called it. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Yep. Stock market returns. Uh, we don't know, right? I mean, we, you could, it, God forbid the people who retired in March of last year, you know, they needed to at least wait another month before they could start tapping into their money. So, you know, stock market returns could be up, could be down um, at retirement age. So, you know, we want to plan accordingly, have, uh, we want to limit our risk in the market. Um, Kind of a, a rule of thumb is the longer, the more years you have to retirement, the more aggressive you can become. There is a Wall Street rule of thumb that says your age, um, it should be deducted. Um, so like, for example, if you're 65 years old, you would want to have 65% of your portfolio um, in, an, in a more aggressive or you could afford to have it in a more aggressive um, position in the market, and the rest of it would be in something that's less aggressive, more like bonds or some fixed assets. Um, so, you know, with that saying, you know, if you're younger and you're 30 years old, then you want to have the flip side. You can afford, you have the time on your side, you can have a little bit more um, for market. Did we get any other risks? All right. All right. So let's go on and, whoops. That's our changing stock market there. So what will I have to retire? And um, this is where I want to introduce uh, Jim Siders. Uh, he is going to talk a little bit more in depth uh, for those who are in the OPERS and the STRS uh, system. Welcome everyone today. I wanted to thank you guys for coming. 
going to kind of hit OPERS and STRS at a high level. I'm going to talk about the timing of retirement um, and talk a little bit about the healthcare changes that are coming within both systems. So let's start with OPERS and then at the end I will also address the ARP. So let's kind of uh, start with OPERS. OPERS, the first thing that you need to know is what group are you in? Are you in group A, B, or C? Because the rules are different for each group. So when you come and, and have a conversation with Tom Michelle, you want to bring a copy of your most recent statements. And they've moved it around a couple of, uh, a couple of times, but it's on the front page of your OPER statement that should come each year in January. we we'll talk about STRS in a little bit. STRS works on a different calendar year and you get your STRS statements in July because they, they base their year based on the school year. So um, with OPERS, determine whether you're A, B, or C. Then once you determine if you're A, B, or C, you need to figure out, am I going to work long enough to have an unreduced pension or am I kind of going to meet the minimum qualifications and have a reduced pension? On your OPER statement, they will tell you both numbers. They will tell you when you reach unreduced and when you can first retire. And they usually give you one other um, example in there. So it's very helpful when you come and talk to Kamashell that you have a copy of that statement and, and, and we can kind of kind of talk you through that process. The next big thing with OPERS that is getting ready to occur is they're going to make some healthcare changes. So let's talk about today and then we'll talk about January. So basically today, somebody who is pre-Medicare age actually has health insurance through mainly medical mutual. There are a couple of uh, exceptions up in the Cleveland area, but mostly uh, medical mutual. And you that's who you really have your insurance from through a purse. Big change coming in January. In January, OPERS is no longer going to be in the healthcare business. They're going to be in the subsidy business. So basically, they are going to provide you a subsidy for you to go out and purchase your, your own health care if you're pre-65, pre-Medicare. Basically, they offer a service where they'll give you some guidance. So that's one option that you could uh, pursue. You could go to the governmental health care plan, the Affordable uh, Health Care Act, and, and purchase through the government plan. You could have coverage through either your own circumstances or a spousal situation where you have some employer coverage, or you could go get private health insurance. So those are all the things that are going to kind of occur. So January 1 is going to be a new world for the for the for OPERS retirees who are pre-Medicare. Basically, the way it works is is OPERS uh, figures health care at about $1,200 a month. And they are going to give you a subsidy based on your years and uh, your age as to how much of the $1,200 they are going to give you to go purchase your own. Let's talk about Medicare-aged retirees in OPER. Medicare-aged retirees have Medicare as their primary coverage. That's true today. Uh, going forward, and really a program that they put in three or four years ago, OPERS got out of the healthcare business for uh, uh, Medicare eligible uh, retirees and started the, a system where they provide a subsidy. Once again, it, it is based upon how many years and your age, but they provide you a certain amount of money each month. There are charts out there that Michelle can discuss your individual circumstances with you. But kind of say, hey, you're going to get, you know, 75% of the subsidy, or you're going to get 90% of the subsidy, and that that information is out there. So, OPERS changes are coming January 1 of next year. So it's a big deal, and if you're considering retiring before that, you need there are some things you need to consider. One of the things that's going to happen is today to qualify for health care, if you don't have an unreduced pension, you have to be age 60 and you have to have 20 years. Going forward, you're going to have to have be age 60 and have 25 years to potentially get health care from OPERS or have the unreduced pension. So changes come in there. It's worth a conversation with Kamashel to, to, you know, to go through and talk about that. Go switch over, go high level on STRS now. STRS does not have the ABCs, but what STRS does is they kind of are in a 
six-year pattern where they're phasing in changes, and really it goes back even further than that. It was originally an eight-year pattern. And basically, they're going for, um, it used to be, as an SCRS retiree, you got your 30 years in, whatever age you were, you could retire. Well, the rules today are you have to, you can be any age, but you have to have 33 years in. And ultimately, in 2026, you're going to have to be age 60 and have 35 years in. So STRS is really changing um, the components that go into qualifying for an unreduced pension. Um, STRS is also making changes on the healthcare side. Today, it only takes 15 years in STRS to qualify for healthcare. In August of 2023, so a couple years out, they're going to go to 20 years. So changes are there, and if you're close to retiring, once again, we want to sit down and talk about it, and, 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 and there could be scenarios where it makes sense for you to retire sooner uh, to have the, the health care eligibility. The big issue with STRS going on right now is the COLA. So historically, I use my, I, I use my father as an or, stepfather technically as an example when he retired his pension was fifty thousand dollars a year he lived 20 years after after uh retiring and each year on his anniversary date he got a fifteen hundred dollar increase in his pension so when he passed away he had an eighty thousand dollar a year pension so went up nice kept up with inflation the way strs is set up today if he was in STRS under today's rules, he retired with a $50,000 pension, he would have died with a $50,000 pension. And when you come in and Comichelle runs the math for you, this not having a cost of living increase is a big deal. And you really, really need to understand it. They are going to, they suspended it in 2017. They are going to revisit it in 2022, but, Unless they would do something on the healthcare side, potentially dramatically like what OPERS is getting ready to do, I don't see them putting the cost of living uh, back in place. And based on their board meetings and stuff, I, I, I think that the cost of living is, is going to continue to, to not exist. Let's move over to our third group of people. We have people who are in the ARP, the Alternative Retirement Plan. In the Alternative Retirement Plan, it's not a formula-driven system. It's, a, it's purely when there's enough money there and you're old enough and the math works, which Tom Michelle can walk you through. Um, it, it's really, that's, that's how the whole system works. Now, the ARP, unless you have it through some other employer or through a spousal situation, there is no potential for additional health care until you get to Medicare age, which is currently age 65. So you really have to be aware of what is your plan for health care if you're going to retire uh, as an ARP person before age 65. There are some options out there. I'm Michelle would be more than happy to talk you through uh, some of your individual options. There are some things that could potentially be done and be looked at, but that's kind of the basis of, of you know, the the three different groups that we have on the, on, on the uh, webinar today. So we're gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about Social Security. And one of the things that Kamashell will send to everybody that, it, that attends this, is she's gonna send out the windfall elimination provision. And the windfall elimination provision addresses um, people who work in Ohio, basically. It's true other places, but the issue in Ohio is in Ohio, when you're employed at Ohio University, you do not pay into Social Security. So the issue that creates is, is when you retire and if you're eligible to get Social Security and you go and file, they're going to bring up the windfall elimination provision. Once again, we're not going to get into all the math of it, but basically a person who uh, works at OU most likely is going to have their Social Security reduced. Doesn't matter if you're in OPERS or SRS or the ARP, but it is very likely that your uh, Social Security is going to be reduced. And it's a great conversation to have with Tom and Shell and, and, and go through and do it. So who qualifies for Social Security? So you are going to get something. You're not going to get nothing if you have the 40 credits in. 
and 40 credits really is earning a thousand dollars for per quarter over um you basically if you earn four thousand dollars in 2020 you would have four quarters of credit you don't have to work in each quarter you basically have to have a, a minimum earnings threshold to do that the number has changed from from time to time but right now it's a, it's a thousand dollars per quarter you make four grand this year paid into social security then you you would qualify and you would receive four credits for this year if you earn a thousand dollars you would earn one credit for the year what's next comment show we've got our Minimum requirements. Oh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. the money. It's the money versus the calendar. Yeah, I just like to hit the highlights. It's not working each quarter. It's how much you make in a calendar year that drives the number. This is another good point. When you're going to come in for even if you're not going to come in, but if you're definitely going to come in, you want to go to SSA.gov and, and, and really go in and see exactly what what what's expected. And it's Pretty simple. You do go in if you don't have an account. You can go in. In the olden days, and I'm old, they used to mail us the statements. They don't do that anymore until you're very close to retirement. So we have to go in, and it looks just like it, it did when it was mailed to you. It's, it's a little four-page thing. When they show it up on the screen, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. But today, you have to go in and do it. They send it to you eh, maybe when you're 60 at that point. So I'm, I'm not sure the exact age. Basically, they're just showing you on here in, in this person's example. Um, basically, they're on their Social Security statement, so they're going to get $1,934 uh, a month. After the windfall elimination provision calculation was run, which Thomas Shell can work you through, basically it, it, it reduced it to $1,477. So the point isn't the dollar amount. Uh, everybody's circumstances are different. It's just that. Social Security does not make that adjustment until you actually go file. So you're, you said, Jim, it says on, it says on my statement for the last 20 years, I was going to get $1,000 a month. I, I agree that that's what the statement says. But when you actually go to file, if you have a bunch of time at OU, the number is going to be less than $1,000 a month. So let's kind of talk through an example here. Basically, we have somebody who is retiring. They're age 67. Their purse benefit is $30,000 a year. <clears throat> We've kind of run some calculations. We feel that they need 35. The question we always get asked, and people's numbers are all over the place, if you need to, th you need to fill in a $5,000 a year gap, how much money does that take today? On the next slide, I believe the answer is there. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's one more. Uh, it's going to take it's going to take eighty. It's going to take eighty five thousand dollars invested, earning four percent a year to fill in the five thousand dollar gap uh, until uh, normal L guys uh, likely demise around age ninety. Right. So that can be a bigger gap to fill than what we than than a five thousand dollar a year. Right. Um, so what we're going to talk about next are supplemental retirement accounts and move on to ways to maximize your funds, right? So if you're, we just did a, a brief example of, okay, if I need an extra 5,000, how much do I need to save to get there? Uh, one way to start saving that through your employer, uh, through OU, is through adding a supplemental retirement account. Um, so... I'll just say that when I sit down with someone uh, and we start looking at your plan, like Jim said, we're going to look first at your your OPERS, your STIR statement, your Social Security statement, all of everything that you've got. And if we do have a uh, a shortfall, one of the ways that we're going to look is first to your employer because this is all pre-tax. It's kind of easy, right, to just add an extra hundred or two hundred dollars a month. Um, if we really are trying to save five thousand, then it's about four hundred dollars a month that we we would add um, to your um, to your savings. Two of the more common uh, accounts, or the ones that are available, I should say, through Ohio University is the 403B or the 457 plan. And um, so this is completely separate from your ARP. So if you already are with FOIA, you could still supplement with a 403B or a 457. Um, 
as well as if you're in the STRS or the OPERS, even though you're already in the pension system, you can supplement with one of these plans. So uh, these are, like I said, tax deferred contributions that come straight out of your paycheck. It's a pretty simple process to get one of these set up. Um, your maximum is 19,500 a year. Uh, we have several people who actually are doing that maximizing and, and uh, if we do the math, we can kind of get a real idea, you know, if it, if it grows at so much a year, um, you know, your compounding uh, growth can really uh, help you catch up uh, on whatever your plan is. Um, you do get to choose your individual investment, so it's not like if, like if you're on the STRS and OPERS, this might be new for you, uh, because um, now you get actually to decide how aggressive or how conservative you want to be, and of course that will be uh, appropriate to whatever your risk tolerance is. Um, the uh, providers are determined by your employer, and I'm just happy to say that Voya is one of those. Uh, another way to kind of fill in that gap is to kind of take a look back and say, okay, uh, what, do, what do I, where have I worked before? Do I have any opportunities for other retirement accounts, right? So um, a traditional IRA is one that you can set you can set up on your own, even if you haven't worked anywhere before and you're just starting here, you can contribute up to $6,000 a month. This would be pre-tax. If you're looking for, a, um, for an extra contribution that's deductible on your tax return, the traditional IRA would be available to you. There are limitations to that depending on what your salary is. Uh, so we would have to take a look. That's, you, know, you, you start phasing out your ability to contribute to an IRA uh, depending on, on your salary. But let's go back. Uh, and say how that traditional IRA can still play a role in your retirement savings um, when you have worked someplace else. Um, so if you're coming from outside and you have a 401k or another 403b or 457 plan, um, we can roll that, it's called a rollover, we can roll those funds into a traditional IRA for you. So, you know, you don't have to worry about contributing. Um, it's all already been saved pre-tax and it's a way of preserving that ability to not pay taxes but still have control over your money. That's one of the number one reasons that people roll over their accounts is uh, into a traditional IRA from former employers is because they want to have control of, of, their, of their investments. Uh, when we're looking for uh, supplemental uh, retirement plans, uh, one of my favorites is the Roth IRA. Because when we're looking for um, ways to, to build income streams in the future, which is, really what we're doing, uh, we have to look with a, a tax conscious eye and uh, try saying that three times fast. <laughs> but if you're, if you are, um, you know, looking ahead and you think that maybe taxes might be going up in the future, um, a Roth IRA would be a, a really good planning tool to set up now because uh, as it is, your contributions are made after tax. It's kind of like a savings account on steroids, right? You're gonna, instead of putting it in uh, into a regular savings account, you're gonna put it into a Roth IRA. It's gonna be invested at, according to your risk tolerance uh, and the withdrawals in the future um, may be tax free. Um, so they are our tax free bucket of money that we're building. There are limitations. Again, it's based on your household income. If you're married, it's, uh, it's or your individual income, there are phase out limitations. Uh, if we have the opportunity to speak, we can go through that um, with you and see how that applies to you. Contribution limits, if you're under 50, you have the same rules as a contribution into a traditional IRA, it's $6,000. Um, and if you're over 50, you get to do some makeup contributions for $1,000. Um, again, uh, being able to manage it on your own, make your own decisions uh, by choosing your individual investments, this is uh, one of the advantages, aside from the tax-free bucket that you're building with a Roth IRA. So, um, oh, and I should say that in order to have this tax-free um, thing, you just need to have your account open for five years. Um, 
gosh, let me, let me, I, I want to just make some important distinguishing uh, differences here in all of these accounts that we've talked about. If you're doing the 457 and the 403B, you want to look at the flexibility. Some people want to be able to take loans. Let's say you're in a STRS and OPERS, you'd want to choose a 403B. You could take a loan. If you are thinking about retiring at 55 um, or, you know, pre-65, you want to go with the 457. The other option would be a Roth IRA. Uh, with a Roth IRA, you have access to all of your contributions. Uh, if you need to take it out for, for any reason, you can. If, as long as you leave the investment alone for five years, the growth, um, then you, that's how you qualify for your tax-free withdrawals. Are there any questions? I, that was a whole lot of information. We've talked about, you know, kind of what you need to bring to the appointment. We've talked about um, how to supplement and plan. Are there any questions so far before we wrap this up? Okay, so you might, are there any questions, Danette? All right, hearing none. Yet. Okay, so we'll wrap this up and talk about how, what are your next steps? How do you actually make a plan that's individualized? Well, we want to establish a timeline. You want to ask yourself, how many, how many years do I have until retirement? If it's 20 years, 10 or 5, it doesn't matter. It's not too late to start, right? We'll take a look uh, if you uh, would like to come in and talk with me, or you may have your own uh, financial advisor that you speak with. When you do make a plan, uh, you want to take a look at your current your current financial situation, right? Bring all those statements in we talked about earlier. I'm going to ask questions like, do you work on a budget? Um, what's, what are your current income? What are your current expenses? Um, and then we'll set some goals together that are uh, manageable. Uh, we will review your current plans that you have in place. And uh, if we need to build extra income streams, we'll make some suggestions uh, toward that end. So um, setting a plan is pretty easy. It is just a conversation that you start. That is one of the things that um, I uh, say at the beginning of every meeting is that this is the beginning of a conversation that we will revisit um, at least once a year. Um, I feel very privileged to uh, work uh, with OU employees through Voya Financial uh, and the credit union to, to offer these services to you. So um, take advantage of them. If you, whether you uh, bank with a credit union or not, whether you are, have your ARP with Voya or not, just know that we are a resource um, here available to you. Um, so. The next thing to do really is just to, uh, to, to take action. Um, how do you reach us? Um, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. I'll show you my contact information. Um, but uh, like I said, it's really easy to start saving. We can do it through your employer uh, to set up a, a, an automatic contribution. Uh, so just, just let us know. I expect to review and meet often. So with that, um, I'll open it up to, to any more remarks. Jim, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, Are there guess, any questions? Uh, yeah, Corey and Dedette, what is the easiest way for people to, to give us questions? Is it, can we go live where they're allowed to talk or is it a situation where it has to be done through the, uh, through the uh, chat box? Um, you, you can either use the um, chat box and ensure that um, you are chatting with all panelists rather than just the host, or there's also a Q&A function um, as well that can be used. Corey, how does the Q&A work? Is that, is, is that? Um, there is a separate chat um, right below where the um, chat is now, and it's labeled Q&A, and um, it allows questions, and then the panelists can answer those. Okay. So why don't why don't we do this? I'll I'll wait for a second, and uh, Danette can kind of watch the the Q and A box and, and bring them up. But basically, kind of what, what I like to get people to think about is is the the journey that I like people to go through as they get closer to retirement. If you are in the state pension systems, I do encourage you to make a visit to Columbus and sit down with them. Uh, two years before you're gonna retire. So you can really understand the math, you can understand what the healthcare is gonna look like, 
you can really understand what the pension is going to be. You know, when you put your spouse on the pension, you know, what reduction does that create? And I, I've had clients who almost waited too long and committed to retire before they really saw the math. So I think it's helpful to come in and, you know, work with the pension systems, come and see Common Shell, and really understand what your circumstances are before you get in there. The healthcare can be really shocking if you are in a situation where your spouse is also going to be on your health care. And a lot of people that work at the university, their spouses are on their health care while they're working. In retirement, it gets a little bit more complicated. So I like for people to go and actually understand, you know, what that's going to be. As an example, uh, in today's world, if you were retired, you could have your spouse on your OPERS coverage, but it's $1,200 a month to have your spouse on there. There's no subsidy for the spouse. So sometimes there's sick, sticker shock when people actually go in and understand, hey, there are taxes coming out of this. Hey, if I put my spouse on here, you know, I'm, it's not a single life annuity at that point. It's a joint life annuity. And typically that's, if you're similar in age, it's a 10% reduction there. So I like for people to look ahead. And when they're looking at their OPER statements or their SDRS statements, they are showing you the payout based on your life alone. They're not showing you the payout based on your spouse's life as well. Most people do take their payouts that way. And it's typically a, at least a 10% reduction in your payout based on your spouse being on the payments. Danette, let's jump in with some questions here. It looks like we got some things going on there and some of them yep. uh, I'll handle and some of them Common Shell will handle. Okay, yeah. So, so far the first question was in regard to Roth IRAs. It's whether or not they can contribute to multiple Roth IRA accounts or if there is a maximum as an individual that they can contribute. So you want you want to jump in there, Kama Shell, sure. or you want me to handle that one? So. Yeah, no, happy to jump in on that one. So the maximum that you can contribute if you're under 50 is 6,000. If you're over age 50, you can contribute up to 7,000. Um, uh, that is per year. So let's just take an example. Uh, I was actually just working with someone today who um, has been contributing to her Roth, but had a $2,000 shortfall from 2020. So we're actually able to catch up prior to April 15th. You can still catch up for 2020 contributions. Um, and actually, if you could go ahead and take care of 2021 as well. So it goes by the calendar year. You're 6,000 if you're under under uh, 50 and 7,000 if you're over 51, over 50. Yeah, great. Um, and there theoretically, th you, you could have multiple accounts. So you could put 3,000 into each, but you can't put six or 7,000 into each. Go ahead, comment shot. Right, right. Um, I am seeing another question here. Um, just a request for maybe some additional information about STRS healthcare system. Um, there's mm -hmm. not really a specific detail on what they're looking for. I don't know if they want to add any more details to the question, um, but maybe it's something we could provide um, provide to the attendees. Um, maybe some links that we could send out to them after. after yeah, the we, event we as well. will do that. And, and will will the links will will it come from Corey? Will it come from Kama Shell, or will it come from you? Um, likely they will come from me. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so you, you you can watch out things for things from Danette. We've already committed that we will send out the windfall elimination provision because it potentially affects all of you. Uh, and we'll send out some of the STRS uh, and we'll, we'll do the same thing with OPERS. We'll kind of give you a good link. They have a good video out there explaining the, the changes that are coming in 2022. So, next question. Next question. If I have 40 credits in Social Security before I worked at OU, will there still be a deduction because I have not been paying in during my employment at OU. Yeah, I, I want to jump in because this this is one where there are two sets of math out there, and, and I don't think that Social Security does a good job of explaining it. There's what you get um, to qualify as a credit, and then there's what you get that counts against the windfall elimination provision. So you have to have a certain threshold of earnings to get a qualifying year with regard to the windfall elimination provision. And basically, you have to have 30 years at 
basically in today's dollars, about $24,000 a year to not have your social security reduced. So yes, you will get a check based on your 40 quarters. Um, if you're truly in a, the situation, a lot of my clients are where they have basically just 10 years in social security, they have 30 years in OPERS or SRS or the ARP, basically, you know, we get into, and it was on the slide, I don't have the number memorized, but basically your maximum reduction is about $500 a month. So if your statement said, hey, you're gonna get $1,000 a month, you know, theoretically, given the right set of circumstances, that could be reduced to 500. The issue is somebody in a circumstance with only 10 years, especially if they were early in your career at lower wages, um, you know, you, you may have substantially less than that. And, and typically, uh, the, the worst case scenario is you end up with about 40% of whatever the number is. Let's say your number is 300 and basically you know, you, you could have a reduction. There is a minimum uh, standard out there and Thomas Shell can get more specific into exactly what your circumstances are. Yeah, if you bring up page, go flip over to page two of what's on the screen. Yep, so, this is what we'll send out. Yeah, this is what we're gonna send out. And, and basically, if, if you look kind of bottom left there, it gives you the substantial earnings number for each year. So, so that's, that's part one. And then part two is the chart. And the chart shows you basically what percentage of your Social Security you're going to get based on how many years of substantial earnings you have. And there, there are some people, they have zero earnings. You know, it was, it was back, you know, I worked at the pool, I worked at Wendy's, you know, that, that's what I did. And there might not be any substantial earnings. You still will get a check, but it's, it, it, it's, it's going to have some reduction to it. So we will send this out to everybody. All right. What do next, Annette? Yep, I have another one here. It says, I'm planning to retire at 62, which is in 2023. Okay. Are all reduced rates, are there reduced rates for health insurance with STRS for the employee and the spouse? Okay, so yeah. so we, we have 2022 and- uh, 20, we, we, 2023 30, is the retirement year. 2023 is the retirement year. Mm -hmm. um, so, Yes, there are, and they are currently still offering uh, the spouse, but the, the spousal coverage, you you basically pay 100% of it. The issue that is going to change in 2023 is, and it sounds like this is a person with more uh, more years in, but you do have to have a minimum of 20 years in STRS to be entitled to health care at all, starting in 2023, August of 2023 to be exact. So. That would be a it'd be a good question and, and somebody in that time frame it would be a good time for you to go and have obviously we can't go right now with all that's going on in the world but you can do a teleconference with strs and and i would i would highly encourage that another thing that we will send out is come shell and i have developed a good pension worksheet so even if you know it, it's something that you know you don't you don't feel that you need any help we have a good sheet for you to take with you uh, to your uh, pension appointments, and, we, and we'll send that out to you as well. The net will send that out to you. It's just a little two or three page thing. And it's all the questions that you would think of if you had all day to think about it, like how Michelle and I do. So it just it just kind of gives you a little checklist to go through, and, and people have found it very helpful. So where are we headed next, Annette? Yeah, um, I'm actually not seeing, let me double check one more time here, one second. Oh, I'm sorry, I do have another. If I am, Retiring this year, who do I contact to move this forward? Uh, and that the, is, yeah, yeah. You and you, would, if uh, we can capture the information, and Michelle will reach out to you. Uh, and Vinette, are we getting both the questions out of the regular chat and the Q and A? I'm, yes. I'm seeing what yep. appears to be some questions in the in the in the in the Q and A. Is that it's all taken care of? I do believe so. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so Charles. Let me double check and make sure I haven't missed any. Mm -hmm. So the thing I always yeah, like I think to so say far. is, is, is I travel all over the country and Ohio's pension systems are very good. Probably the best um, outside of a, a group of people in Washington. I'll let you guess who they are. Um, but it is not 
for most people, unless you have more than 35 years in, uh, most people need to do something uh, on the supplement side. So I, I would encourage you to do a Roth, do a 403B, do a 457. And I'd encourage you just, you know, to, to take the time. The, the credit union does not charge fees for the initial meetings. And I would encourage you to come in and, and, and uh, you know, either when I say come in, I know what that means right now. It could be a video conference, could be a call. Um, you know, come in and have a, a conversation with Commerce because it's just information and that's all we're really trying to get out to you. You know, we, we didn't really talk about FOIA today. It's not the purpose of the day. And so, you know, if you say, Jim, I'm with TI Craft and I love them, I think that's great. It still may be a good idea for you to come in and and have a, a conversation with Commerce Show. So you just, yeah, you know the right questions to ask when you're thinking about the, the uh, you know, thinking about retirement. And I will add that we are having limited in-person in appointments. So certain days of the week, um, I, I am available uh, for in-person if that is preferable. Okay. I am not seeing any more questions come through. Um, any final comments from our presenters? Corey, is there any follow-up that needs to be done or will they be receiving any uh, follow-ups on the seminar uh, through uh, the credit unions marketing? Uh, yes, we do have a recording of this that will go out to all um, folks who are in, it, in attendance. Um, so that will be coming. Super. Great. We're here to help if you need it. Um, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, it's always, the highlight of my evening to uh, or day actually to talk about retirement. It's it's what I really enjoy helping people navigate uh, their planning. So enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye.